I absolutely love watching really extreme films and I love like rape revenge films and things like that, uh, which I know often can be seen as a, a strange thing uh, for, a, for a woman to love. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm like, well, why wouldn't I love a film like that? Like it is really uh, cathartic. And, and, and Jerry, I know that you love films uh, very similar to that. What would you kind of say about this element of trauma? Yeah, I do. And it's an interesting thing to think that uh, people think, you know, no, those are men's movies, right? So you have uh, an entire series of movies that's that's looking at, the, at women's trauma and yet, and then how maybe they can take back the power, uh, especially with these rape revenge movies. But then you have, you know, a whole chorus of voices saying, like, how can you like that as a woman? That's completely exploitative. But the, the point is that it's not, uh, it's not always completely exploitative. And, and even when it is, you know, it's, it's about having a right to, to kind of take that space just as much as a man. And what I see recently in these newer films that are coming out that like I blame society and these films that are really looking at women taking back their power before anything even happens to them, you know, this kind of, twist on only a man can be that violent. Yeah, I think that that's a huge, it's a huge turning point because these films have always been around, you know, like Jillian says, and, but they've always been male written, you know, directed. It's always been from that perspective. And there is merit to those films as well. But now it's kind of like, there's something that happens as women, because we are taught from very young ages to fear everything, everything's scary. You are, you are at any point a victim. And so, you know, I really think that this is kind of a, a taking back that narrative from, you know, just only that's a, that's men's space only. And now I need to explain to you why I like that and giving it a voice by having female directors and female writers taking a place in it. And the women that act in these films saying, I'm doing this because I love it. And I have something to say. I think that's really important. I think that's what we're seeing most of all, like nowadays, which I think is amazing. Yeah, and I think it adds a, a particular power to it, doesn't it? Because it, it's, you know, it's it's not from the male's perspective. It's from the, the, the perspective of a, a female that wants to tell that story, which, you know, Harley in A Little More Flesh too, without giving, you know, too many spoilers or anything, that's, I would say that's kind of, you know, absolutely what it feels like is yes, there's a lot of trauma shown um, in that film on screen, but it really feels like you kind of, you are the one telling the narrative. And, you know, I know we have uh, Sam here uh, watching along and obviously Sam was a big part of that, but it does kind of, you know, you can hear your voice throughout the entirety of that film. Yeah, I mean, I think I, uh, hopping off of what everyone has said really, as more of us are telling our stories, we're seeing, more of this because it's it's a huge part of the female experience when we were making a lot more flesh too i started having all these conversations with my trying to surreptitiously gathering information for my research um from friends and every female identifying person had multiple stories that they shared with me um and it's just it was it was so difficult because it, it was a truth I knew, but no, like fully knowing and understanding something and the size of it and how much bigger it is um, than any of us is just, I don't know, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was difficult. And it, and it is, and I think that's, um, you know, I think for all of us, that's kind of the, the, one of the biggest things that constantly comes through is, is just how, many of us have been affected by similar things and have gone through this trauma in real life and you know I think that's also why we find quite a strong catharsis through the films and you know connecting you know like just here with the panel connecting with everyone mm -hmm. um Ariel I know that you also watch a lot of uh kind of films with with trauma and similar similar to myself and and Jerry what's your kind of take on this I mean, my take on the films with trauma that I find myself constantly kind of called on to defend, like yourself and Jerry, I, I feel like these films offer women kind of full rights of self-expression. 
uh, now that women are allowed to kind of enter into these spaces and to say, you know, like in Jillian's film, you know, you are allowed to be a serial killer. You can be a smart serial killer and a woman. Um, you can be a victim of trauma and shoot yourself as a victim of trauma, as in Harley's case with a little more flesh too. And I feel like we need to be acknowledging these parts of ourselves as women, both as, uh, both in terms of our own capabilities, but also in terms of what is sort of innate within the female experience in some way. Um, I, I find that whenever I'm with a group of people, it almost inevitably comes up if it's a largely female group of people and we're talking about horror at length. Horror is something that binds a lot of people because of the sort of underlying trauma that a lot of us have experienced as women. And I feel like, you know, for women who are sort of taking back that power, trauma is always going to be a part of that. And I... I just really think it's wonderful that we have so many filmmakers on this panel who have been a part of that, so. Absolutely, I think, um, yeah, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that, you know, there's, there is that power through, through the filmmaking. I think, you know, as, as horror fans, it's, it's something that we kind of, you know, they're almost, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but also, almost to me, they're often comfort films in a, in a slightly bizarre way, but, you know, we, we can turn to them in kind of moments and, and also recognize that our, our stories and our representations um, are being told. And, and Ariel, you touched there on, you know, women kind of taking back violence and killers and, you know, for, for decades, we've been, the victims, unfortunately, you know, you think of a lot of films and it's, uh, you know, scantily clad women running around be being murdered because of God knows what they've done. Um, and Robin raises a really good point in the chat, actually saying um, that she finds films that focus more around women's anger um, and violence are a lot more empowering and cathartic compared to men's anger, which I think, you know, we kind of started touching on it a little bit there. Um, but for instance, you know, there's a lot of films now, you know, think of uh, uh, I Blame Society, where we're seeing a lot of female killers or predators. Um, do you kind of think that this might be our attempt to stop ourselves from being the victims and saying, you know, we actually are, we can be killers. And I'm going to throw this to Gillian first, seeing as it kind of ties into I Blame Society. Well, I mean, the, the reason that I uh, chose to have the character be a, a murderer didn't have anything to do with uh, female representation. It had to do with uh, metaphor. And I think that that's where I've always thought that horror was superior to any other genre because it operates in the extreme. Its leverage of metaphor is more powerful and more effective than any other genre. So, so that's what I, I was thinking there. No, that, and that absolutely makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, then kind of thinking for me of um, a, a female that's kind of, you know, taking back, I guess, the power and the violence kind of going back to um, Robin's point is uh, Ifke in your film, Lily. Again, I don't want to give away spoilers because um, I want people to watch this, but I would say certainly in there, you know, and it's a, I actually found it really tough to watch short, but it's really tough. But the violence is, is certainly taken back in a, in a really, um, I don't know, enjoyable way. What was your kind of reasoning behind that? For me, um, Lily is kind of my personal reaction to Me Too. Uh, like when Me Too hit, it was for me, it was like, oh man, we, we are so much stronger than we think we are. And, and you know, we're not alone. So that, that kind of that, that what I was going through there, I kind of poured into, into Lily. I mean, also wanting to show like, this is what it feels like to people who are like, this Me Too was just bullshit. I'm like, no, it wasn't. And this is what it feels like. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely, for me, it was claiming the power back, but also showing the inner strength that that I think we have, and we kind of sometimes forget that we have. Um, so for me, it was definitely one that I, I wanted to play with, with, you know, reclaiming the power. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's absolutely what happens. Um, and I want to pick up on, on 
Uh, a couple of, of points here is, you know, kind of, again, talking about uh, that kind of reclaiming of power. Uh, Harley, obviously, in A Little More Flesh 2, although it's, again, trying not to give spoilers, there's a couple of elements uh, that ties into this film towards the end that perhaps kind of make sure that there's not uh, a sole focus, let's say, on the victimization um, of your character, which is uh, where Lauren comes into to play. Um, what was your kind of, of reasoning behind making sure that perhaps, you know, the power wasn't solely uh, left in the, let's say, you know, the, the abuser's hands? Well, that was one of the things I, I felt very strongly about when making the film is that the ending, I wanted um, it not, to seem like a total defeat. Um, I wanted, and that's why I'm so grateful that Lauren was able to be involved in the project. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'm so, I'm so anxious about spoilers. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna stop talking before I say anything that I shouldn't say and get in trouble with Sam, cause I know he's watching. <laughs> All right. We that's okay. <laughs> of course because I don't want to give away spoilers at all um so again kind of going back to the the aspect of um stopping women from being victims with killers and predators what are your uh thoughts on this Ariel so I feel like uh you know we've we've always seen sort of the monstrous female like from the very beginning on cinema um I I feel like there has always been you know, some masculine gaze that has regarded, you know, psychotic women in a certain light, etc. But we've very rarely seen sort of the smart uh, killer portrayed. But I feel like we're we're now at a juncture where um, I I said it before, but I but I do mean it. You know, allowing women full personhood rights on screen is essential right at this juncture and I feel like um, especially with a lot of the films that are represented by uh, the strong women here there are so many uh, narratives that are specifically kind of reclaiming where we come from as women in cinema um, where the monstrous is not actually exactly what it was perceived to be by men originally like it's it's no longer sort of the isabel ajani sexuality thing it's more an intellectual kind of killer that is allowed to have full self-expression in some way that is not just terrifying in some way psychologically to a man um if that makes sense but. Yeah, that that makes absolute sense. And um, kind of thinking about that and, you know, making sure it is more about the the, the women in that is, uh, Lauren, you've played in, you know, thinking of films like The Woman um, and also Darling from 2015. Um, both of those films are, you know, really powerful. And obviously, I think, you know, The Woman's a really tough film. Uh, because of course it, it shows, you know, uh, horrific abuse uh, to one woman at the hands of, um, you know, men and the son, but also, you know, your character in that is the daughter of a man who essentially is abusing the, the whole family, you know, awful. Um, so what's your kind of take on, on this representation of, you know, female killers um, and predators versus, versus male ones? Yeah, my, the thing with the woman and, and really a lot of the films that I've chosen was because they were representations of, of things that I had maybe not seen directly, but knew about that existed in society. Um, you know, these, <laughs> the, the men that, that capture women, young women, children, and put them in like this happened in Ohio and put them in like the back in a shed for many, many years. And um, I mean, this happens a lot like that's absolutely mad um, and, and horrific. And I think that it's important that we don't forget that. Um, and that's, that's why I think these films are important that we don't forget that these people exist and that they're around because in a lot of these uh, 
these moments, right, these, these horrible uh, things that have happened, there were neighbors, there were people involved that saw signs that did nothing because they thought, eh, maybe, maybe my head's playing with me, maybe that's not what it is. And, you know, maybe it is. And I, I think that, um, that we just need to continue to be aware of these things. And I have, you know, I kind of have like limitations with certain, like, okay, like rape revenge genres, I would say that, you know, you could put the women in that category. For me, like the, the thing that kind of crosses the line is sometimes it's time, it's minutes. Like how many minutes are we watching someone go through something terrible? And, and, the, and what's, what else is happening? Like, are we, are we not cutting away? Are we not cutting away for a reason? Like what's the, and then how is that moment put inside of the rest of the film? Like, I don't look at parts, pieces and parts. I have to look at the whole picture of what we're looking at and the story that's being told. And that's how I decide whether or not I want to get involved in a project. Um, and yeah, and men and women are different in, in how they kill. And that's the other thing too. Like, I don't appreciate when people just put a woman in a role that was written for a man. And that's when, it, that's when it sucks. And you can always tell when a guy writes for a woman, you're just like, we don't say this shit. Like, that's not how we fucking talk or act. Um, so, and we're all different too. Like, yeah, there are some, you know, cuckoo cocoa puffs that go out there maybe and have like googly eyes and shit, but like, there are also very calculating women and manipulative women. And, and women that, that there's sociopaths that are women that don't feel any shit. I mean, most of them go into nursing um, and then, you know, you get your angel of deaths and shit like that. So, I mean, this is the thing, like we're a rainbow of madness and like, not just, you know, yeah. Like the Joan Crawford and straight jacket. Um, and also, you know, typically we've got a really good fucking reason for it. Um, and that's what I like about these films too. Like, it's not just, you know, I, you know, death wish and I want to be a badass or whatever. And it's like, no, probably somebody fucked us over. And it's just, you know, you fucked with the wrong one. And that's kind of like how I feel about at least Darling. It was just like, you know, you fuck with the wrong one. Sorry. Yeah. And I think, you know, where you said there that, you know, women kill, kill in such a different way and have different reasons. I think that is something that, you know, in a film like Darling or in many of these other films is so prominent and actually important to the story is, you know, the reasons behind. Um, and Jerry, to come to you kind of last, because I know you you recently actually wrote a piece, um, Fogles, about do we need more female killers on screen? Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you kind of, you know, like a few female killers. Yeah, spoilers, we do. I mean, <laughs> uh, they, there is not a monopoly on dangerous people. And as you know, uh, I, I say in my, in my you know, editorial that like, yeah, men are, bigger, stronger. Okay. That's just like a, just a way of life. You know, we, we know that as women, we are on, we're constantly reminded, uh, but you know, what we have is like some imagination and <laughs> it, it's interesting. It's more interesting for me to see, uh, a woman who has to think about, you know, just in this, the kind of plot, way that we're thinking inside of the film who needs to think about how she's going to kill and who needs to go about it in a way that's different than just walking up behind somebody and grabbing them and i mean for me i i think that that is a hundred times more interesting not that they're like not that i don't watch the hell out of you know some slashers and say okay he's a big strong you know mutant man uh, that's amazing too but uh you know as far as just like use a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of, again i have to go back to i blame society there's a lot in there i just like watching it that was exactly what i needed at that time and i think we're gonna see more and more like this because even though women do typically have reasons to act out like that reasons and we don't see it a lot unless you know it is in the rape revenge and i think that yet yeah, men can just like I have a bad day. So now I'm going to go kill some people, women, you know, we're, we're more, you know, we're more buttoned up and we're going to wait until something pushes us to the very last, uh, last thread. And I, I do think that we're going to see more and more of films where it's not just, you know, you did me wrong, but it is like, I'm taking back this, this place that I'm not given in society. 
And for the writers out there, you know, female writers that are writing women, how many times have we gotten the like, you know, that's not very likable for her to do that. And, you know, where is that usually coming from? And so then we have to think, okay, well, what would be likable for like this person that I'm giving it to? And I don't know, I just think that uh, the more we push into that space, the more we're gonna take it back. And uh, I think everyone on this panel um, who has a film in the festival has done that. And I'm incredibly impressed by it and I wanna see more of it and more. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, I want to see more women killing the shit out of of any anyone. To be honest, you know, I'm not not bothered who, as long as it's not animals, we're good. Like that's that's kind of the limit. We'll we'll draw a line there. Um, and I, you know, kind kind of uh, now kind of going over to more thinking about like creating safe spaces. Um, in Lily, in A Little More Flesh 2, in I Blame Society, I think what we see is the boundaries pushed um, and also crossed uh, when it kind of comes to, you know, art versus reality. Um, and where do those lines stop between, you know, how, how far will someone go to kind of get their, their art in a different way, um, but causing harm at the same time? So my kind of question here is, how do we in real life ensure that those lines aren't crossed? Um, and how do we begin to keep the film industry a, a safe space, especially for women, um, but for anyone that might be, you know, in a in a vulnerable position or, or just trying to um, do what they think is is best to get through um, through that. So I'm going to start uh, with you, Ifke, because I think you you know Lily really, again, no spoilers, but Lily really kind of hones in on, on that. Uh, yeah, before I just was thinking of something which I quickly wanted to share, which you said before this. Um, Lily premiered in Korea, um, and I was lucky enough to, to be there. And at the end of it, this, this Korean girl walks up to me with like this awesome green hair and like super cool chick. Uh, barely spoke any English, but she just grabbed me. She's like, kill more rude men. And then she like walked away. I'm like, yes, that is awesome. I'm like, I promise I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, regarding creating safe spaces, I think it, it sounds so easy, but it's not. But just listen to people, um, like like have a space where you're open to, to people saying, um, you know, I don't feel comfortable. I do feel comfortable. Check in, um, you know, see see how everybody just is. And I, I think hopefully now we're also moving away from it. it sets used to have this this toxic and they still a lot of times have this toxic male energy of like I have to yell because then I'm strong and then you'll respect me and it's like god can we just go away from that like you don't need to run a set on fear like of course you're tired and especially if you're doing feature stuff uh, you're gonna sometimes snip at each other but just check in and listen and and be respectful and also you know women are not and people of color as well we're not a quota that you have to hit like, it's not like, oh, great, we need 50%, now we have them, and then we're going to treat them like shit. Like, that, that's not how that works. Like, we have stuff to offer. We can actually, you know, we're good at our jobs. And just create a space where, where people are, are open to, to saying what's on their mind and listening to them. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, I think listening is a big, a big one for us all just, you know, actually being listened to is, is, is so refreshing. Um, and, and Gillian, what, what are your kind of thoughts on this? I mean, um, you know, it's funny, the all of the sets that that I've been on uh, in the sense that, you know, like my shorts and uh, and my the last film that I did have been really female dominated spaces. And, it, and it's not because um, it, interestingly, it wasn't because I consciously set out and was like, I need like a female only space. It was that, you know, I want to. Um, you know, who do I know who's going to support what I'm doing? And who do I know who's going to be intrigued by this project and I feel is going to like bring good energy to this set? And I think, and who is the most competent person for this job? And I ended up having all female department heads except for in sound. And that just was how it worked out. And I was glad that 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 was how it felt that way. And it did make it really more comfortable because we had such such a small set on um, on I Blame Society, and 
and there was, you know, nudity involved and things like that. And so, um, you know, but to be fair, like my sound guy was a, you know, a total prince and I felt comfortable with, um, you know, it, it's a funny situation being a director and an actor because with your sound person to go on an interesting tangent, because it's a very intimate thing. The person is like miking you all the time and handling your body all the time. So you being both their kind of boss and also their like material, it's a it's an interesting balance. And so that's like kind of one of those departments that you don't think about where it's really important to have a person that you have trust and a person that you have, um, you know, that there's transparency with. And I, I think that, you know, we talked about, you know, um, the importance of hearing people, I think the importance of transparency is also really important. You know, transparency about what's in the script, do you feel comfortable with this, you know, if, and also, you know, self-selection, like if, you know, if, if you're taking a job and there's something in the script, you know, that is uncomfortable to you, like feel okay to say no, that that's not the right thing for you, you know? Yeah, and I think um, actually, you know, that that's a really interesting point is is that kind of element of of having, I guess, trust on set and you know feeling comfortable with the things you're you're being asked to do whilst on set because, like you said, you know, a lot of it can be intimate, can be quite, you know, uh, I mean, I'm coming from my own point of view. I, you know, I can barely show uh, my boyfriend me most of the time. So, you know, I can imagine it's like quite difficult um, to be in a situation like that and be so open and comfortable, especially when it comes to like something uh, like nudity, for instance. Um, and Lauren, you know, you're an actress. You obviously have to put a lot of trust in in the people that you work with um, in, in on set and, you know, in terms of nudity and things like that, kind of what's your take on uh, having this, you know, these safe spaces and, and transparency, like Gillian said as well? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's funny because I guess I, what's sad is that whenever I got into, you know, when I started in films and everything, like Jug Face, I think was my first nude role um, where I had nudity and sex scene and then Darling, but like, things I had been on toxic sets beforehand and I just kind of came into it just feeling like this is going to be really shitty uh, and then what happened was like Chad was awesome on Jug Face and he he didn't know anything about shooting nudity and when we got we pushed it he kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and it was literally the last thing that we shot in the entire film which was great because we had been there for so long we knew everybody um, so that was really cool, actually. And if I had the option to do that again, even though it's not in continuity, I would probably do that again, um, unless it's supposed to be an awkward sex scene. But for this, it was supposed to be like, we've had sex before. This is a comfortable thing. Like we have passion, even though we're siblings. Um, but so I, I really liked that we had like two weeks to get to know each other and to get to know the crew and everything. So by the time we did that, like it wasn't really a big deal. Then Chad did have a closed set, um, which means that only the necessary people were there. And he actually did that for everything that was even remotely like a traumatic scene. Like when we get whipped in it, um, the bathtub scene with me, um, where I actually think I had some knickers on anyway, but like anything that was just like a traumatic moment, he wanted a closed set so that he could we could take time if we needed to. And, and that's something that you really don't get sometimes on indie sets because you don't have time. But the way that he did it was, it was like, okay, we're not gonna do 20 takes of this because I'm not gonna put my actors through this because you don't need to do that. And when you talk to these directors that have like 20 and 30 takes, they always go, yeah, and we pick the second one. <laughs> and I'm like, no, stop doing that. Stop it. You're wasting everyone's time. You're putting us through hell. It's completely unnecessary. Like, stop it. <laughs> Just because like Kubrick did it. I don't know. Like, you're not him. He's dead. Like, let's forget about it. Um, and then, and I do, I mean, I do purposefully pick more women to be in my crew. I really try to, unless, yeah, I mean, if there's like, if someone was like miles, leagues above the other person, I wouldn't pick the woman just because it's a woman. Um, but it does make everything more calm and guys do get tired and they're like, I need my protein. And then they start screaming or it's on my head. And it's just like, ugh. 
And women just make things more calm and like, let's solve a problem. How would you like this to be solved? Could I come with some options for you? And we can like compromise and find something together. And it's like, when you do that, instead of just sighing and like going, no, we've got a fucking problem. Then like, you know, surprisingly you save time and you can actually move through things faster. And then you don't have it happen again. Like that's a really important thing. Um, and yeah, and just as an actor, like no matter, and like, if you're just starting out, I don't know anyone who's listening to this or watching, and maybe you're just starting out in acting and you feel like, I definitely felt like I couldn't say anything. I was so nervous. I just didn't want to be seen as a difficult person. And, you know, it fuck that. It doesn't matter. Like just, you need to say what you need for your best performance because it's your face out there and it's your name. And like, if this is the last thing you do because you asked for some time, then like, you know, fuck it. Like you don't want to be in this business. And um, yeah, I've said, I've said no to things based on scripts that I thought were exploitative. And I said it in a really nice way and actually had a director come back at me later and said, like, I didn't have the balls to do it. <laughs> I was like, oh word. Okay. Wow. So yeah, it turns out he's a terrible person and hasn't made a film in a long time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, mm. that, that literally, you know, what you just said there goes to show that, unfortunately, we, we do still live in a world where this is, you know, it's still prevalent and we do, and, you know, the fact that we're even having this conversation about, you know, how do we keep people safe is, in a way, it's kind of depressing that we're here having to have that conversation. Um, but, you know, it is great to hear that, that there are directors out there and there are men out there that are willing to create a safe space for people to work in. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, that that really brings me on to um, yourself, Harley, and, you know, a little more flesh. It's, it's quite a, a bearing film for, for you and your performance. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you kind of say about safe spaces? Well, speaking from my own perspective um, and having... This is, this is my first professional job um, and nearly having another professional job a few years ago and it being the most horrendous experience similar to what Lauren referred to with her. Um, I think what I learned from my experience was to be absolutely certain, clear about your personal boundaries and going into every job knowing, like, knowing fully what they are and how to how to like exercise them on set and just be and uh, because my situation was like a frog in water and just it got hotter and hotter and hotter and somehow I was miles away from what, where I was comfortable and with not knowing how to escape and I was saved by a makeup artist who could see I was uncomfortable and just you know rescued me and so that brings me on to my second point which I think is looking out for each other as much as possible on set and wherever you see something do something um and then thirdly is obviously make your own work <laughs> you can guarantee that you're if you if you're creating your own space you're it's going to be safe um yeah so that's what i have to say and work with someone like sam <laughs> who like you know and the whole the process of how we made that film just was so safe for me because i was shooting i had complete creative control over what material we were making because I was shooting it myself, lighting it myself, costuming myself, you know, writing myself. Um, so that was very, that was the safest environment I could possibly be in, hope to be in. Absolutely. And I, and I guess, you know, to, to a certain extent, that, that kind of element of, of having control. And again, it, I guess it goes back to a lot about communication and, you know, uh, kind of what you were saying, Lauren, and being able to, you know, communicate someone and, you know, air grievances or Gillian, what you were saying about, um, you know, making sure that you say if you don't feel comfortable with something you get that out there I think that's 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 really important and I kind of have a slightly different question um for Ariel and Jerry because obviously we're not f filmmakers we're, we're we're fans of horror um and also uh we're, we're critics of, of the genre but we kind of you know get tied into things but also you know there is a danger of um being at the hands of uh, people that are just as shitty in that world as well. Um, so what do you think about kind of creating 
safe spaces uh, online more so um, for people that are like, you know, critics or, or fans of the, the horror genre. I'm going to throw that over to you, Ariel. Sure. So I think like among among fans and uh, critics and so forth, there are a lot of different layers of toxicity that are out there in online spaces, for sure. And I feel like on some level, uh, some of it filters down even from the studio toxicity. You know, when I was, I, I, I'm sorry, we keep bringing up I Blame Society because it's a brilliant film. But, you know, at those moments when the guys are saying intersectionality, 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 you know, those really rang true for me because I have heard so many people, you know, say those words repeatedly as if, you know, I as a film critic should be responding to what they as white men saw within their film and they were upset with me for not seeing what they thought they had put in there, you know, with their strong female lead, etc. I have faced bullying from different uh, people about what I chose to write about or uh, speak about on my podcast with different things. But I've also seen that there are lots of people who have a tendency to try to drown out any voice in the room that doesn't agree with them. And so I feel like for women in particular, who very frequently are taught to kind of be quiet, be subservient, be, you know, agreeable, get along, you know, and, and you will somehow get your reward in the end. In order to have safe spaces, we need our voices to be valued and to be heard. And we need people to actually be advocating for us to speak up and to have our voices reflected in these spaces. Because I feel like um, I've heard from so many different people that if critics who are female are not responding to the works of female filmmakers and their voices are not heard, you know, perhaps more loudly than the male critics, oftentimes a sense of perspective is lost about many of the works that are most important in the moment. So this is where I stand on this issue. But it's, oh, and it's yeah. And, and you're, oh, you're so right when you talk about, um, you know, female perspectives commenting on like female uh, created films because you know the amount of times I think um, and I, I don't name any names but there was a really big male critic that um, you know I saw slated promising young woman and was like this is just a piece of trash like what 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 is this film and you know so many uh, women I know were like this film is amazing it's empowering it makes me feel you know and it tells a truth a hard truth in this film and I think you know it was just so disappointing to see the that male's perspective was so you know negative and clearly didn't even take into consideration um any of the the female perspective from that um and what about you Jerry what do you think about kind of you know creating these safe spaces online yeah well I mean to be perfectly honest I haven't had like a lot of the bullying experience um but I do have a a man's first name. <laughs> so I don't know how much that plays into it. Uh, you know, if you don't see my picture alongside, I have had multiple uh, meetings where my face pops up on the screen and the person's like, oh, <laughs> you're a woman. I say, hello. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I'm not saying that that's a thing, but it definitely could be. Um, and I do have to say also that I think it's important for women critics I don't love to use that word, but, uh, you know, film critics to be able to watch a movie that is from a female creator and not necessarily love it and not get behind it just because, I mean, we, we support each other, uh, but on the same hand, I don't, uh, tear movies apart because I, everybody is going to come at a movie differently. Everybody's going to look at something differently. It's completely, <laughs> it's ridiculous to think I am the end all be all. And I know that what, what I feel is the right thing and then put that on paper. I couldn't and I won't. And so it's more frustrating to me uh, as a female 
film critic to hear, oh, you don't like that movie, but it's written and directed by a woman. So are you, aren't you not supporting that woman? No, I absolutely support all of it, but it doesn't mean that I like it. And it doesn't mean that I, I agree with everything that uh, is in the movie, you know? So that's just something that, that can be, that's just as, you know, uh, limiting to us as, as anything else, as online bullying, which is a completely huge thing. I mean, horror fans are amazing. Um, and the community is amazing, but at the same time, it can also be really harsh. And there's a lot of voices coming from a lot of different directions. And so I think it's all about being able to have a voice, like Ariel said, just, you know, we should all be able to speak up and we should all be able to speak out and say what we think. And it, we don't have to wait patiently and subserviently for our turn to talk <laughs> unless we're in a Zoom panel and then you do so because that's the nice thing to do. <laughs> that's how I feel about the issue. Well, I'm also happy for you guys, you know, to just go wild and, you know, start screaming and shouting. I would love that, to be honest. Um, but you're right, you know, even even when it comes to kind of like critiquing, especially for us, you know, not feeling like you have to go, oh, I love that film because it was made by a female is in a way even more derogatory. You know, it's just going and, you know, whoever made that film is going, oh, what, you only like it or gave it a good review because of my gender, which feels completely wrong. You know, I guess one of the things that essentially we're striving for is, you know, just equality and kind of going, it's, uh, we just, we want to be critiqued the same as, as anyone else. And you take the film for what the film is. Obviously there might be elements um, that come through because it's from a, a female director and that's absolutely fine to pick up on those cues, but you're right, Jerry, like it's not about kind of, you know, critiquing and going, I have to like it um, because I have to support and love everything every woman in the world makes because I don't think that's right. Um, Mitch has asked a very good question and I'm going to kind of open this to anyone um, on the panel that just wants to kind of come off mute, put your hand up um, and answer this. So Mitch has asked how uh, we can make film festivals um, a safer place for women and I guess you know kind of even broadening it than than women is you know any marginalized voice I think um I think it's not just women that are searching for these safe spaces and and in need of them so I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on kind of film festivals in particular and how to make them um really safe spaces I can, I can jump in on this. I think first and foremost, stop yelling whore at the screen whenever there's a woman in, 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 in the frame. I know there's still a lot of festivals that do that. Um, that, that would help. Um, but also, I think, I mean, just coming from the short side of this, um, I've very rarely done a Q&A where it wasn't just all men and, and, and me and all white men most of the time. I think I've only done two or three Q&As at all in my life where there were people of color standing there as well. Um, so I think that also goes from the programming side, like find those movies. And I know they're still they're still rare, but it's it's becoming more and more. And I think the more you can showcase them, the more other people will be inspired to make them. Um, and I think also, yeah, having those people there, like having them have a mic in their hand and talk about the movie, I think would help a lot with the audience as well, just seeing it. And I mean, the one thing I do like about horror festivals is that it's the only place in the world where the female bathroom line is shorter than the male bathroom line. So I will miss that eventually. <laughs> But I do hope that it, that it evens out. <laughs> no, and you're um, you're so right about kind of. Uh, I I went to it, and I'm not going to name the film festival. I went to a film festival uh, where there was a panel, and there was uh, one woman on that panel with a microphone, and she spoke once. She was completely spoken over, um, and it just seemed like there was absolutely no interest whatsoever. Um, in her having a, a, a voice, which was, you know, absolutely um, ridiculous. So, yeah, I don't know if uh, anyone else on the panel has got any thoughts on on film festivals in particular. Um, if not, I'll, I'll skip to the go on, Lauren. I was just going to say, just making the uh, making sure that the volunteers of the festival are aware that you know someone might come out of the theater upset about something that they've seen. Just like we know that people pass out. At, the, at film festivals. And I think that we're pretty good about that now. Like if someone passes out, someone goes, they rush in, they get them out. 
they get them some air, some water, whatever, you know, there might even be a medic there to check their blood pressure and stuff like that. Um, I think that if the volunteers are just kind of prepped, like if someone comes out of here, like crying their eyes out, maybe, you know, take the initiative and go and make sure that they're okay. Do they have someone with them? Do they want us to go and get that person? Is there someone they want to call? Do they want to just like be by themselves and just like check on them, make sure that they're okay. Um, you know, um, and then if a volunteer feels like they are not comfortable with this, that they know who to go to so that, you know, if there's one volunteer by themselves and they see someone run off, they don't feel like they can go, they can go talk to somebody else. And that the person that's approaching that would be a woman. I think that would be the best, um, the best scenario, but just so that we're kind of prepared for these, because also I've definitely been, I remember I went to a screening and it was about domestic violence and it was with a lot of women and I knew what I was going into. And as a survivor of domestic violence, I still absolutely couldn't take it and like broke down and left. And there nobody, <laughs> nobody came to like see if I was okay. <laughs> and like I was, I like eventually got myself together and everything. But it was like it was just surreal being in this place surrounded by all these like people who were, were making this film about something and like nobody checked to see the like woman that burst out of the doors. <laughs> No, but that's a, I mean, and that's a really good point because um, Ariel, I'll come to you in a second. It's a really good point because actually, you know, I think um, a lot of a lot of things can be triggering for us all when I think, yeah, I mean, going to a film festival and watching something, and, you know, like, for instance, Mitch, you did a, a fantastic uh, job today, at, you know, kind of highlighting the point that we might, uh, some of the films showed today uh, obviously could be a little bit triggering for some people. They can be quite tough to watch. Um, and even even coming into this discussion, you know, you mentioned that we might talk about some topics that um, are perhaps not going to be, you know, quite so easy to broach. And I think that's uh, I think that's really really important um, that we kind of you know raise. Uh, awareness and have other people you know mention those things and also you know I think what wonderful idea Lauren to have people um at a festival that you you could talk to after that because yeah I mean you know festivals can be that <laughs> they're overwhelming uh without watching a film that's quite quite tough uh, quite tough to watch anyway um Ariel you uh you had your your hand up and I know you are Ariel is basically the the queen of festivals so I'm sure you've heard what it is. <laughs> well, one one quick note that I kind of had that um, is one of my marginalizations. I'm I'm openly disabled, and one of uh, the things that I find in a lot of festival spaces that programmers aren't thinking about is the fact that uh, you may have a lot of people watching films who are photosensitive or have photosensitive epilepsy. And very few film festivals actually, more people actually program content warnings related to uh, graphic violence or suggestive content than actually notify you if there's strobe lighting, which can cause actual uh, harm and potential death in your audience. And it's very important to me that when people are talking about creating safe spaces, that this is one thing that absolutely needs to enter into conversations around festivals. So I'm just gonna take this opportunity for that PSA, but yeah. No, I second I that, cause I also have a seizure disorder and that's happened to me that all of a sudden there's a club scene and I'm like, oh God. And I just have to like duck out or something, yeah. Well, I guess, you know, in, in general, you know, accessibility, um, is is really important for you know for disabilities for anyone that's you know for anything like this uh, it, it I think it's actually something that's also not addressed very much online um, you know for instance uh, things like subtitles you know a lot of people need to watch films with subtitles um, that's really important I've been to film festivals again where there's no wheelchair access to a to a screening there's nowhere to put a wheelchair and I'm like what who, who, you know, who's going to come and what, like, it just, it's about, you know, kind of going back to making sure that all people of all walks of life, regardless of who you are, everything is accessible and everything is, um, 
you know represented uh, at those film festivals and I think that that really then begins to bring the community um, together and make us all have kind of like a, a sense um, together and uh, I, there's, I'm going to just go through now, I'm going to ask a couple more questions um, from the chat because we've probably got about 10, 15 minutes um, left to answer some questions. So if anyone's got any further questions, just pop them in the chat um, and I'll go through them now. I'm just gonna, gonna open up the floor. So again, we'll just go through a th similar one. Um, so Andrew's asked whether uh, we think women are generally supportive of each other in creative projects like horror films. I'm not sure if anyone's got any thoughts on that. Okay, I can jump in on this one. Yes, they, they are. And I, I kind of, going into the horror world, I was very scared also coming off of, you know, the 80s where there was one woman in every position. And so we would fight each other to just have that one position. And then, and I was a little bit afraid that that might be the same, like, you know, how many female horror directors are allowed to exist in the world? Um, and it has been the exact opposite. It's been the most supportive community uh, like I've met a lot of people now we, we formed like coven book club where we're like sharing like cool horror books together and like we have like these female perspectives on them so it's like I, I, I have friends of mine that read my scripts and the other way around it's it's been like seriously the most supportive and wonderful community within that. I'm going to second that based on being sort of a, a fledgling filmmaker I'm just making my first horror short this summer and I have found so many women who are so supportive in terms of making my own projects pretty much everywhere so yeah i think um i mean my experience is like everyone's been super super um supportive of like projects and things like that um and i think that's been really really important i think you know kind of supporting one another is is one of the the most important aspects um there is and i don't know about uh harley or jillian you know the support you kind of got from uh other other women on your projects well it was just me sam and another man so <laughs> i can't speak specifically about women apart from the um horror fans that have been the most welcoming this is as i said i keep reiterating that it's my first film and I've never been more welcomed by a community <laughs> ever. It's incredible. The support's been the support the supporters have been great. Yeah, it's quite a, a strong community, um, the horror community. I do feel like uh, we certainly go out there and, and march for the things we enjoy. And what about yourself, uh, Gillian? I mean, I, I think that you know, um, there's a there's a mix. You know, like some people like do or do not like your project or they do or do not like your work. You know, I think that there is a, there's an issue sometimes of women policing other women when it comes to what they have to say about sexuality or, or certain topics, you know, uh, women are, um, you know, are not a monolith and, and they can, they can come from, from different backgrounds and different places and they can, you know, truly, truly feel those, those things. And I, I guess I think that we have to, to allow women to have that, that spectrum and, and, and not kind of essentialize them the way that, you know, exactly what Jerry was saying. I thought that she put it so well um, about it being important that, you know, women are allowed to have opinions about, about other women's work. And it's in, it shouldn't be an expectation that, um, just because you're a woman, you should like that lady's movie because you know you guys maybe perhaps share some biology, but you know not necessarily. I think that you know that leads to to other kinds of stereotyping and like what you were kind of saying, Zoe, about you know equality being the most important. I think that that way we're kind of seen as individuals and we don't we are not put on a pedestal in a way that can be that can be negative as well. And that can be a, a, a dangerous place to tear us down from, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, pedestals are very dangerous places um, to put people. And yeah, I don't think that we should be 
necessarily putting people on them um because i think it does certainly make things uh unrealistic um in a way so yeah well I'm probably going to wrap things up now because uh, we've we've run a little bit over time and I'm sure everyone is going to want to grab a drink um, before the rest of the film show. Uh, but it's been absolutely fantastic having you all here today. And I think, you know, I think we've discussed a lot about kind of, you know, the representation um, on screen and also, you know, the things that for us are really important when it comes to creating those, those safe spaces, whether it's online, offline, um, on a film set. And I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure we could all probably talk so much more about it and have many other ideas. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much. Um, Mitch, I don't think there's any other questions uh for us so yeah thank you all do make sure that you know you check out um everyone's films there's a little more flesh too i blame society lily uh and obviously you can check out um jerry and ariel's writings at ghouls magazine and lots of other places and basically everyone's got so much amazing stuff going on um and i'll you know i know mitch and i will share the shit out of all the links of everyone and everything so yeah thank thank you so so much for this insightful conversation. Um, and thank you again, Mitch, for, for having us. Well, no, thank you. Thank you so, so much and for guiding that fascinating discussion with such grace and intelligence. And honestly, I, I, I it's been a delight that hour has disappeared. So thank you so much. And of course, thank you for what you are doing with Girls Magazine. Um, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say I, I've been so bowled over and amazed by how that collective has taken off and just the, the sheer quality and essentialness of the voices that are being platformed and that lifted there. Um, I just wanted to just ask, um, how can people, find, in case there is anyone that's listening, that isn't too familiar with girls, how can they find it and how can they support you guys? Um, you can find Ghouls Magazine. We are Ghouls Magazine on all social media sites, nice and easy. Uh, also ghoulsmagazine.com. Um, and in terms of supporting, if you want to support the amazing writers, um, if you go onto the website and you go support us, we've got a donation button um, to send in some donations. And once we get some of those in, those will go to the writers. Um, and we also have some nice merchandise um, and also our membership uh, which you can join and you can get lots of monthly extra content. Um, and yeah, just, just come and follow us and, and listen to the amazing writer's work that we have, basically. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Like you said, Zoe, thank you, everyone, um, for, for, for speaking and for listening as well. Um, and I think that's kind of the big takeaway, isn't it? Let's, let's continue to listen as much as possible. Um, everyone, I hope you are ready for our next film beginning at half seven um, or our next films I should say because we, we will also be playing Ivka's uh, fantastic Lily as well opening for a little more flesh too so um, yes I think if we we bid that adieu now um, we will I should mention as well um, at around about 10, between 10 15 um there will be a live red carpet live q a uh, that will be fully interactive for a little more flesh too um that will also kind of naturally evolve into our normal zoom after party so um, please you are all welcome please do join for as little or as long as you would like it usually goes to around five in the morning so it's also super conducive to people on the other side of the ocean as well so um do please join us for that. Um, but I, yeah, I hope you enjoy the films across the weekend. And if you, if any of the content does affect you over this weekend, please do reach out, whether it is to any of the support organisations that we are um, sharing, or even if it is just to us in the DMs, um, please, please speak out. That's all. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Take care. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Thanks, Zoe.